Hubbard, and I am the Ombudsman at National Public Radio. Let's all say that, Ombudsman. Ombudsman. I get Ombudsman. Uh, uh, at the New York Times has this position, and they call it the uh, public editor, so maybe that's an easier thing to say. Ombudsman is a Swedish word, and it basically is an advocate for the public. So tell me, is, does everybody here speak really good English? Should I get up really, really fast? Or how do you? No, it's possible. Yes, okay. Uh, I lived in Japan, and so I learned to speak Japanese, so I always asked uh, people in Japan to speak slowly and clearly so I could understand them. And I admire the fact that you can speak two languages. Um, so an ombudsman is an advocate for the public. Uh, so National Public Radio produces about 40 hours of programming a week right here in this building. And then it gets sent out to public radio stations across the country. There's about 800 of them. So NPR is not a radio station and it is not a TV station. It just makes content. Does that make sense? And uh, so I'm going to sit down. Uh, so in those hours of content, uh, there are probably you know, 21 to 27 million people that listen uh, throughout a week. The most popular show is called Morning Edition, which is in the morning. It's two hours. And yet, because of the time difference, it will start at 5 o'clock in the morning, and it'll go till 7 in the morning here in Washington. But then there's the time difference. It's one hour later in Chicago, and then an hour later in uh, Denver, and then three hours, and something three hours later. So it actually goes from 5 in the morning till noon, and they're constantly updating it. But they just... The, first two hours are the fresh new hours. Say that, you know, the Bush administration practiced torture, they should be prosecuted. Uh, that's the role of a pundit or a commentator or someone giving their opinion. Uh, but there are people who feel, in the United States, who feel very strongly that when you waterboard someone, you are torturing them. So my solution is that you don't say whether it's torture, but you describe it. When I describe to you that you would tie someone down, you know, stuff a rag in their mouth, pour water over it for 20 to 40 seconds, uh, which is a very long time. If right now I was stopped talking for 10 seconds, you would all feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it may sound like, ah, 20 to 40 seconds, it's a long time. It, you know. um, so my feeling is describe these techniques, let the listeners decide. But not everybody agrees with me on that. And, uh, so sometimes this can be like the loneliest job in the newsroom because I, I'm hired by NPR um, but I really work for the public, and uh, I, am not, I do not take NPR's side. So, for instance, NPR says to use enhanced interrogation techniques instead of the word torture. Well, I think that sounds like a euphemism. I mean, that sounds like another way of saying, I mean, it just it makes it sound nice, right? Uh, enhanced interrogation technique versus torture. So. One of the interesting things about this debate is that um, I, I will just read to you what um, I was just on a talk show talking about this. And uh, so this is the Geneva Convention, which was a body of, I'm not even sure exactly how to describe it, but it's sort of international protocol that countries sign on. And they say that the term torture means any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted for the purpose of obtaining information um, or a confession. So punishing 
consent or for the purpose of um, punishing or co forcing someone to give information. Well, I was sort of thinking, what do the Amer uh, you know, you watch probably American TV, you watch American police shows, uh, you know, police, <laughs> police, um, you know, uh, act by, you know, from severe pain, they intentionally inflict pain on people, they throw them against the wall, they, you know, punch them, they, I mean, they're not supposed to, but we don't call that torture in the United States, we call that police brutality or abuse. So anyway, that's enough about torture, but you get the idea that language is very powerful. And um, so, I have been working here for about a year and a half, and the way that I am protected uh, from being fired <laughs> for writing things that NPR would not like uh, is that I have a contract. And uh, so I, I have to, I act independently. This position has um, started in, I think, 2000, so I'm the third ombudsman, and uh, it, you know, sometimes I say things about the organization on, on my column or my blog uh, that they don't like, and or that the people uh, writing, you know, the people who work here don't like. So my job isn't to protect the people; it's to make sure that NPR continues to practice good journalism. I also teach uh, media ethics of, about good journalism. I teach at Georgetown University. Uh, so, do you all um, have any questions or? So I'd like to know maybe a little bit about you or? Well, well I'll start off and all just right. describe generally the group. Yeah. Um, this is a, a pretty good mix of Armenians and um, U.S. students. Okay. Though we are missing the Azeris, uh, they, their flight was delayed. Um, and they're all using social media and new media applications to inject their voices into media in, on issues of social relevance to youth, globally, um, here in the U.S. and um, abroad. Mm -hmm. As you know, Amy and Azerbaijan um, haven't had a lot of communication over the last, to say the least, right. um, over some time. So part of the um, uh, objective of the program is also to really foster uh, cross-cultural dialogue, Good. using the media as a forum to okay. do that. How many of you are on Facebook? <laughs> all, all of you? <laughs> um, you know, so it's, it's interesting, like right now, you, I'm gonna imagine, are you all in high school? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you think Facebook is fun, and, uh, but I've, I have come to the conclusion that um, we live in a new world with social media. There are many, many pluses, but as journalists, it can be very dangerous. And even as people, not dangerous in the sense that your life is threatened, but um, you have to be very careful what you put on there because it can and will be used against you. And so for journalists, Facebook and, and Twitter are good tools um, you know, to say, what do you think or does anybody know uh, somebody who voted for Bush who is a diehard Democrat? You know, you're trying to find people that you want to be able to interview. So that would be a good technique. Uh, but we live in a world now where I say the microphone is always on. Somebody's listening, somebody's watching. Uh, it's not that this is uh, you know, a communist country and we have no freedom. It's just that there is no, the concept of privacy that I grew up with in the United States is gone. And it's not necessarily a bad thing because there's a lot that you gain, but you have to be thinking all the time. And I'll give you an example. 